Topeka City Council meeting will come to order. If you would please rise as you're able and give your attention to Councilman Jensen for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm sorry to have to ask for a moment of silence for the continued gun violence we've had in our community. I'm really hoping that, I, I know we have top-notch police that are on it and trying to address this as quickly as possible, but we need your prayers and help to continue making our community better and helping it heal from these tragic acts of violence. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. City, Interim City Manager, we have a presentation this evening. If you want to um, introduce and proceed. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce tonight um, Aubrey Oderman. She is uh, our auditor and she's going to present the city's annual uh, financial audit. Um, not to spoil the news, but uh, every year I've been associated with the audit, which is less three years now. We keep getting better and you keep challenging us to get better. And I'm sure Aubrey will affirm that this year we've gotten better again with less violations and less areas of concern. So uh, hopefully I'm not setting her up for failure, but she's <laughs> supposed to be saying those kinds of things. So I'd like to ask Aubrey to come up. I would also like to acknowledge um, Simon Martinez, if I could have Simon stand. Yes. Simon is our chief accounting officer and he's largely responsible for being the liaison between us and our auditing staff. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jason. All right. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Audrey Oderman and I'm with Mize Hauser and Company. I'm here to present the audit and answer any questions that you may have. I'd like to start out by looking at pages one through three, which is our auditor's report. This report goes through and it discusses the different components of the audit. It talks about the auditor's responsibility, management's responsibility, but most importantly, what everybody wants to hear is the opinion on the financial statement. So that's on the top of page two under the heading uh, or titled opinions. Um, it goes through and it talks about all the different parts of the financial statements and it gives an opinion over each part of these, these financial statements. Each opinion over each part is an unmodified opinion, so it's the highest opinion that the financial statements can receive. It speaks about the work that you do here and the directive that you give management and the work that Nikki and Simon and their staff do every day as well as the individual departments. Part of that opinion really is talking about internal controls and taking our suggestions and implementing them and, and um, implementing best practices. So an unmodified opinion is the highest opinion these financial statements can receive. I'm gonna kind of flip forward a little bit, but page, pages four through six, 16 really are my favorite part of the financial statements because it's management's opportunity to look at the prior year and the current year and give an analysis of events that occurred, whether it was projects that happened or um, debt that was issued, um, economic developments within the city, those are all discussed in management's discussion analysis. So I encourage you to read that. So a lot of really good information in it and it's really the only place Place where we compare the prior year to the current year and give some analysis in that area. And then on to pages 17 and 18. This also is the only place where we bring the city onto two pages. So if you're look, used to looking at a business financial statement or a non-for-profit financial statement, this is the closest thing you're gonna get because it's pulling the city all into two pages. Um, and you can see governmental activities and business activities, what's supposed to look like an income statement. Um, this is where you wanna look if you wanna see the city as a whole is page 17 and 18. And now I'm gonna jump way ahead and go to some additional communication that we provide in these financial statements. The bulk of the financial statements are the city's financial statements. We really just provide three letters that where we represent our opinions on things. So when I jump all the way forward to page 135, that's where we're talking about some communication that we're giving you again. 
any entity that spends more than $750,000 in federal aid has to have what's called a single audit. So that's an audit of those federal programs. These pages starting on 135 are where we're doing that special audit. We go through and we select the major programs, programs that we, may, we believe may be, have the most risk because they're new or they have a lot of compliance issues, and we pick those and rotate those. This year, we audited the home grant as well as the continuum of care grant. Part of that audit is looking at supporting documentation, compliance with the federal government, as well as some compliance at the state end if the money comes through the state first. There's a lot of very detailed testing that goes into place for these particular audits. This year, those two audits both received an unmodified opinion. So again, it's the highest opinion they can receive, and they didn't actually even have any findings. So your staff is doing a really great job in those particular departments of adhering to all of the different compliance requirements, and there's plenty in these particular departments for sure. So they've done a great job, very well documented, and we didn't have any findings over those two audits this year. On to page, let's see here, 141 and 142. This is where we talk about internal controls and the testing that we do over internal controls. We can't give an opinion on internal controls. We can notify you if there's any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, but we don't actually give an opinion. We go through and we look at the controls, we give suggestions, and at times we may uh, elevate that to a significant deficiency, and we did do that on page 138. So you, you'll kind of note when we started auditing, this is the fourth year that we've done the audit. The first year that we did an audit, there was actually material weakness. So that's a higher level of deficiency than what's currently in the audit. We feel like while there's still areas for improvement, we don't feel like there's any, there is any area where there would be a material misstatement. So we didn't feel like a material weakness was warranted, that it was a significant deficiency, an area for the city to continue to work on. And the number of accounts that we feel like there's maybe some control deficiencies have become fewer and fewer each year that we've worked on the audit. This year, really, it kind of revolved around some debt and some different premium accounts and a capital asset retirement that was missed in the prior year. Um, I've talked to both Simon and Nikki about what we're gonna work towards doing in the next audit and some tools that we believe could potentially eliminate this finding in the future that will help the city, we think will help them control, um, control these particular accounts and make sure that they're tying out to the supporting documentation when the audit occurs. So we feel like this is not something um, that is a real issue, it's not a real huge control issue, it's not a material issue, it's just an area for the, the city to continue working um, to improve upon. Okay, so the very last report that we have in these financial statements is on page 143 and 144, and this is just a report that talks about that work that we did over the federal grant, and it talks about that unmodified opinion on those two grants. Um, there's a lot of very technical language within this letter, but what it really boils down to is an unmodified opinion over those two grants that we looked at. Okay. Um, I just wanna say that when we come out and we work with Nikki and their staff and all of your individual departments, we're treated very professionally. Um, and they work very hard to get us the information as quickly and efficiently as they can. And we appreciate that very much. We often, often don't know if it's just to get us out the door, as it is at many of our clients, um, but really they do a very good job of getting us the information that, they ask, that we ask for very quickly. And they do take our recommendations very seriously and always ask, um, you know, how can we do this better or how can we do this differently? So we appreciate that very much as well. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for the report, and yes. it's always good to hear. Of every year, it's better. It's improving and going Absolutely. in that direction. That's the key to be right. going in that direction. That's right. Council, are there questions, comments, discussion on the audit? That's always a good sign, apparently. That's good. Um, <laughs> but all right. Thank you. Thank right, you very thank much. You. And that completes the presentations. Uh, we will go then to the roll call. Councilmember Hiller? Here. Councilmember Here. Here. Ortiz? Here. 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 Jensen? Present. Here. Cullen? Here. Harmon? And 
here. And Councilman Harmon said he will be he will be joining us. He was detained, but will be joining us shortly. Um, there are no additions or deletions to the agenda. Uh, Council, there will be one short uh, executive session at the end of the meeting. Uh, we'll continue then to the appointments. Clerk would read. It's a board appointment recommending the appointment of Cindy Wilson. To the Topeka Public Building Commission for a term ending May 17, 2021. Okay, that is the appointment for your consideration. Councilwoman Elisa. Uh, moves to approve. Councilwoman Claire seconds. And no discussion. All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. The mayor does not vote. We have eight yes. Eight having voted yes, the appointment is approved. I would like to introduce Cindy Wilson, if you would stand. Cindy uh, works at West Star and joining the, um, the Building Commission, Topeka City Building Commission, which is the one that oversees uh, the entities such as the uh, KBI building on Washburn campus, most recently other city uh, state government buildings where this group does the bonding for them, for the state, which is a very interesting process, and they only really work when there's a need. So they don't meet regularly, but when they do meet, it's very, very important stuff. Thank you for serving. Appreciate it, Cindy. We'll proceed with the consent agenda. As a resolution introduced by Councilmember Sandra Clear, granting visit Topeka an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seek concerning noise prohibitions. B is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Sylvia Ortiz, granting visit Topeka an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seek concerning noise prohibitions. C is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Sandra Clear, granting Caw Valley Bank an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seek concerning noise, pro noise prohibitions. D is an ordinance introduced by Interim City Manager Doug Gerber, allowing and approving city expenditures for the period of April 1st, 2017 through April 28, 2017, and enumerating said expenditures therein. E is minutes of the regular meeting of May 9th, 2017, and F, there is a list of applications before you. That is the consent agenda. My pleasure. Councilman Jensen moves to approve. Councilwoman Schwartz seconds. Um, there's no discussion. All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. We have nine yes. Nine having voted yes, the consent agenda is approved as read. We go to the action items for this evening, the resolution on the countywide sales tax. A is a resolution introduced by Interim City Manager Doug Gerber regarding the use of excess countywide retailer sales tax that was in effect from January 1, 2005 uh, to December 31st, 2016. Uh, Mr. Interim City Manager. Mr. Mayor, thank you. As you are aware, this item has been discussed at previous council meetings. In fact, was uh, most recently discussed at the April 18th meeting and then deferred to a date specific, which was, <coughs> excuse me, which was this meeting. Uh, tonight, I'd like to um, maybe refresh all of our memories and take sort of a two-track discussion. The first track uh, of the train that we're trying to drive here is the, the legal basis of how we can use these excess funds. And then after the city attorney addresses that, then she'll turn it back over to me and we'll talk about what we're recommending for those funds and, and how we came to that conclusion. Okay. So I'd ask the city attorney to address that. Okay. Thank you, city manager, good morning, body. Um, as Doug mentioned at the April 18th meeting, we talked about this. You all asked uh, legal to take a look at the issue of whether or not the use of the excess funds should be tied to the ballot issue. That was the primary um, issue that we were to look into. And as you'll recall, the April um, or August 3rd, 2004 ballot had eight specific items listed. Seven of those items were specific infrastructure projects, and each of those projects has been completed. I believe all of them have now been paid for or will very soon be paid for. So that left only one item on the ballot, and that was economic development. So at that point in time, the question became, um, 
what encompasses economic development and the question was does affordable housing fit anywhere within um, that structure. Um, so in researching, we um, did all kinds of you know, Google searches, we pulled all the city documents, the state documents, and we found that there were a very wide variety of um, documents that did reference affordable housing in conjunction with economic development. And probably the one that was most telling was um, the document entitled Economic Development Incentives. And it's a document that basically outlines the incentives that are used by the state um, as well as by the county and the city. And there were references made to um, affordable housing issues in each of those documents, and particularly this one. So the opinion at the end of the day was that while someone could legally challenge that potentially, as anyone can, um, we believe their success would be improbable. Um, and if the governing body chooses to uh, designate any portion of excess funds towards affordable housing, it would fit within the economic development piece. And if that's a policy decision you all wish to make, that's certainly one that, that you can make. But that's up to you as to whether you do so. All right. <coughs> Are there any questions on that, on that aspect of it, Councilman Ortiz? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I didn't see anywhere um, in all the emails that you sent us. Did you pull the original question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have it with you? Yes. Can I look at it, please? one clear as much as I agree that affordable housing is needed I've been there with my daughter mm -hmm. I also think there are other economic developments that are needed and how we, how are we gonna pick and choose and why would yeah. this one get more than this one um, why is this over mental health why is this over youth why is this over other economic developments is my struggle and, and then I'm wondering, well, then how far does the city's funds need to go into all that? If we put it into economic development, what are we going to have left for everything else? So I'm, I'm really concerned with starting this process and then having others come forward and want the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'll pass one to Lisa. Thank you, Mayor Wolgas. I, I sincerely appreciate the work that staff, staff put into making sure that whatever the decision is tonight, it's one that is legally binding and that we could make decisions upon. My concern is we, as a city, as we're looking at our, our community and we've been evaluating our strategic plan and we're looking and addressing what are the issues that ail our community, poverty has come to be the number one issue. Um, and when you take a look at what we keep on hearing, is that there is a crisis with regards to available housing. Um, right now, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in NetReach. How do we go ahead and facilitate um, proper housing for individuals in the area so that we could go ahead and just start transitioning some of those homes? Um, where is a city in that? Part of our responsibility is ensuring that we have healthy neighborhoods. And part of our responsibility is ensuring as well that we have proper economic development. So I see the efforts that we're doing Herculean in the sense of allocating a significant amount of funds towards the road, and I don't disagree with the funds that we are going to put back into roads because it's necessary and our constituent has said that we need it. But I really do think that that $500,000 that we're discussing is a seed in order for us to be able to capitalize on, on something that we could build upon that would not necessarily be the city's responsibility, but that it would show as, as additional support of funds that we may not be receiving from the federal government because we don't know what the federal government is going to hold for us in the future. And today, at this point in time, we are providing significant amount of, of support that we don't know if the future holds. So I think that us being able to put that there safeguards and sends a message to other private investors, because this is a public private partnership. Um, I think that we have a lot of people here that if that $500,000 was there, I would call each of them to also contribute some way, somehow to that so that we could keep on growing that pool. Um, so I'm, I'm a supporter of this. And um, when the moment comes, I would be happy to go ahead and make a motion to see if we could add that to our resolutions. Okay. 
Uh, now, I know, interim city manager, you had a part two. <laughs> and why don't we go to that as, as a part of this full discussion? We certainly can, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, part two, I, I mostly wanted to discuss what was in the resolution because it is different than what you had previously seen. It's sort of back full circle to where it started. And that is we're recommending that the balance of the excess funds be used for infrastructure. And we came to that decision not lightly, certainly, or came to that recommendation, it's your decision, but we came to that recommendation not lightly, but based on a couple of factors. Um, first factor for us was that infrastructure is the number one council priority going into the budget. We've heard that from you over and over. We've heard it from our citizens over and over. We keep hearing it, so there's that. Uh, secondly, we think it's more in line with the spirit of the original sales tax and that those line up nicely. As the city attorney said, you can certainly use it for the other and it's not out of the spirit, so to speak, but infrastructure is more in line with it. Uh, thirdly, we uh, sent you an email within the last week letting you know that we actually have less excess funds than we had originally anticipated, uh, about 236,000 less. And so pulling that much back less from streets didn't seem uh, like a good recommendation to us. And then finally, we think that we would want to commit then after whatever vote happens, if it doesn't include affordable housing, we would want to commit to taking the next month or two, coming back to this body with a solid plan that you can cuss and discuss, digest, and a funding source to address affordable housing. There's already conversations that are happening between city staff and some of our external partners towards that regard. Certainly Nikki and her team are looking to locate those potential other funds. So the wheels are turning on that particular piece, but I think it will give us, I think it's a better approach and it lets us come back to you with details that you're going to want before we move forward with anything related to affordable housing. Thank you. All right, so the, what you're saying, the full amount then <coughs> in the Hassan sales tax would be used, go into the, um, the, the, the phrase pavement management what we're saying is that I don't have the resolution right here. Mr. Mayor, specifically, yes, um, the, the resolution dedicates the balance of the excess funds yeah. towards a pavement management program. We anticipate okay. splitting that over three years as outlined in the CIP plan. Okay, so it gives about a third of it over each of the next three over years, the next couple during, years. The, uh, during our construction season. Starting as soon as this fall, potentially. Okay, as some this year. Councilman Clare. Is the other funding the city funds or outside funding? Um, Mr. Mayor and Councilwoman, we're working to um, locate some city funds for this process, but also have the conversation about what other external funds those city funds could potentially generate. That makes sense? Yes, but aren't we also asking each department in, you know, like, ECD to look for ways to cut spending. I do not think that's fair. Let's cut ECD, but let's find the money and give it to someone else. I, I just don't think that's fair, but okay. that's later discussion. Yeah. Okay. Well, and actually, I, I think this is a good direction to go. I, I think, uh, well, we have, First of all, the fact that we have less money than we thought we were going to have was one reason. And secondly, I think we'll be much better to talk about whether whatever other possibilities there are to have a plan to talk about, rather than just saying it's going for this. Uh, and that plan comes back to us, you know, to the council, whether we, whether we want to do that or go in that direction or not, and it can be then. Councilman Jensen. Thank you, Your Honor. At the end of the day, folks, this is going to raise taxes. That's all there is to it. We're either going to allocate 500000 out of roads now. We're going to allocate 500000 whatever the number is, out of other programs and funding sources to fund uh, housing and neighborhood development at, or, or affordable housing at some point in the future. Uh, and then we're going to have to come up with more money for roads. We're, we're going to have to raise taxes to solve these problems at some point. There's just no way around that. We, the roads problem is too large. The affordable housing problem is too large. 
So in any of the decisions that we make tonight, in the next few months, what have you, at some point it's going to generate the need for higher taxes. So whether we bite it off now or bite it off later, that's what it's going to create. The alternative is to cut services. We either raise taxes or cut services because we can't continue to shuffle money around. There just isn't that much of it to do that. So whether we vote on it tonight or not, we're going to have to come up with the money to fix these problems. And ultimately, uh, you know, maybe that's, we discuss a different half cent sales tax going into 2019. Um, that's the unfortunate reality of it. So as we weigh these decisions, realize that if we bite off another project to fix in the community, and I don't disagree that affordable housing is a serious problem, um, the more city money we spread over the more programs, the less effective it is and the larger need there is to raise taxes. Okay, Councilman Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Ware. Well, you know, Mr. Jensen, there's not a whole lot of money in the pot, mm -hmm. you know, um, so um, we, we need to recognize that. But my issue is um, I, I realize that affordable housing is needed and it's wanted, and I did say wanted, um, but there's a lot of issues that we have. You know, you talked about all the crimes and the shootings and the mental illness. We have an issue there. So how much does the government play in all these areas? You know, because if we want crime to stop, mm -hmm. we need to get the help that we need. We got people sitting in jail that's costing us $100 a day because we can't get them in a state hospital. Yep. So um, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to looking at the plan overall. Mm -hmm. I don't think a month or two will do it. I think we need to, uh, to have several months of conversation. Um, and I think a partnership would be granted and would be good. And I think when we talk about partnerships, we, we've done it with different projects, downtown Topeka. They wanted mm -hmm. us to put in all the bells and whistles. And we stopped and said, no. Uh -huh. And they came up with $1.5 million because uh -huh. they wanted it. And I think as a partnership, we, we have to continue to do that. Absolutely. Because what I've heard from my constituents is that money that I voted yes for was for streets. That money that I voted yes for was to continue to fix our streets that are mm -hmm. terrible. And, and that's what I've heard a lot of. I've also heard the opposing side that says, yes, we need affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I'm not real confident that the numbers are where they say they are. I'd like to see us do a better challenge of trying to find those numbers. Um, I'm concerned about the veterans mm -hmm. and their housing, because again, there's some issues there, but we're not addressing mental health, mental health yep. issues and we're not addressing the veterans. There's, I'd like to see us address the youth. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see us, so there's a poverty, there's a whole bunch, There's we can go on and on, and I understand what we're talking about, but I'd like to see us have a better partnership. You've hit on the most important okay, wait, wait, question just, we will me. ask. We have to be, have to be recognized. And, 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 I, and I think mm -hmm. we can. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So if I could respond. Yes. You've hit on the Mr. most Jackson. important question of all, which is what is the role of government in any of these issues? And I don't have a clear, comfortable feeling on that in this case or a lot of the other ones yet just in terms of how we have to fund everything. Uh, they're all very important issues. Mental health is one of the number one drivers of housing issues. But in this case, we're not addressing any of that. So it, it's a chicken and egg scenario. Uh, it, it, this is tough. I, I don't disagree. You've made some excellent points. What, what last one? Yeah, I, I just want to sum that up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've talked to Mr. Feeker, and we now have the elderly that they're calling, the hospitals is calling because the nursing homes are putting them out of the nursing homes because of the Medicare problem. That's way above us, I understand, that's at the federal level. But we have that issue that Barry is not even prepared for, he, he, he's not even designed to do that. What are we gonna do about the elderly? Because it's real. Go talk to Barry. It's real. He gets tons of calls that are elderly are being put out of nursing homes because they no longer have Medicaid and they no longer are that transition because of our federal government that has screwed all that up and they can't make that transition and they can't keep them there. And I said, is that, can they legally do that? And yes, they can. 
Yes, they can. So Barry is getting all these calls on people that are 65 and older that they want to transition from the nursing home to the mission that we don't have room for. What are we going to do about that? Thank well, you, Mr. Mayor. Councilwoman Delisla, and then after, when, after her comments, then we're going to bring this focus back together. I, yes. I sincerely appreciate the comments of my colleagues, and um, I think that there's there's a few things that I'm that I'm listening to, and, I, and I'm going to try to summarize what I'm listening, what I'm hearing. Um, first of all, I think that that the the discussion with regards to this raises taxes. Um, I don't think that this right now does because it's it's a special quote unquote additional funding that we had. It, it was a windfall that we had. And, and it's about us trying to figure out what the best place would be. Absolutely. Most of it was dedicated towards, towards the roads, and there was that portion that was devoted, you know, with the intent that it was going to be for economic development. I wish that we could go ahead and say, let's put this into mental health, because I think that everybody knows that mental health is near and dear to my heart. Um, however, that is not the parameters that we have in this legal document. Um, what I'm hearing from the body and what I hear from my colleague, Councilwoman Ortiz, and what I'm hearing from Councilman Jensen and from Councilwoman um, Clear is there should be a holistic evaluation of what it is that the city is funding. And I think that this body tasked the ECD with that job. So I don't know if what we're hearing is there should be a refocusing on what priorities the Economic and Community Development Council um, Committee is going to be funding. Um, and if there is some direction from the body of the council to say that there should be a shift for next year when we're discussing funding priorities. Mm -hmm. um, that way we're not sitting up here trying to make policy on the fly, which is never a good idea. Um, especially when we have a committee designated to take a look at what the critical needs are in the community and to see how we're going to fund them. Now, I will remind everybody that what this does to us is that there's many organizations that today are receiving funding through that committee because the city has committed to support social services that may not fit the criteria that we may outline as a body that we would like to serve. So that if this is the direction that we're gonna take, and if there's going to be changes in the funding, that we're all standing together when we do so. Because it's very challenging for these, uh, I'm a committee member, to sit down and then have to go ahead and have the battle back and forth because priorities are changing and organizations are not being funded. So what I'm hearing is a larger, broader discussion at the policy level, at the committee level that is designated for this specific purpose, and it would be wonderful to hear, either by consensus at some other point or when the moment is right, what those priorities are so that we could then move forward supporting those social services that the city feels are key to our success. We have before us, we're on item 6A, a resolution <laughs> that provides that the remaining half cent sales tax countywide of 9.8 million be placed in the pavement management project. That's our resolution that's before us. So I think let's, you know, we focus on that. I think we should take action on it tonight because if we're going to put this in, you know, we, as the city, interim city manager said, we could use some of this on our streets by this fall. But that means there's gotta be design work. You can't wait and approve this later and keep pushing it back and expect to have it spent this summer. So I think, you know, do we want to put all this into the pavement management program? That's our discussion. Or if not, we need to have amendment to or motion to approve this, and then we need to go to an amendment. Councilman and Deputy Mayor Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation. Okay, you're moving approval of the resolution. Okay. Councilwoman Schwartz Schw seconds. Uh, we have discussion on that, and we do have public comment. <coughs> if you want to go to public comment at this point, uh, Councilman oh, Ortiz. I just want to make sure I'm clear, because we said we had an A and B part, so the B part was to put all the funding into yeah. um, streets. Is that correct? <coughs> Council, yeah. So what was the A part? Councilman, the, the A part was uh, a legal analysis of what the funds can be used for, okay. and then the B part was a recommendation. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. okay very good. 
Councilman Jensen. Just a quick question. So if the intent is to split the spending of this up over three years, is there any harm in putting an amendment on there that says provided no other funding source can be found in year three that that tail end money is then allocated to um, uh, housing and neighbor, or, I'm sorry, affordable housing is designated by whatever program we put in place. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilman Jensen, I'll, I'll give you a generic answer and the answer is that is a policy decision okay. that this body can make. Uh, the caveat would be that in three years, all of our problems only grow exponentially, whether it's housing, streets, or otherwise. Agreed. Well, my assumption would be that we continue working on that second idea through another funding source um, and then execute the plan beforehand, which would then unlock this 500000 off the tail end that would then go into the streets budget and what would that be, 2020, something like that? Yeah. So that way we have a plan A, and then if for some reason that fails, we have a plan B that would basically be a stopgap, essentially. Okay. Any other <laughs> points right now? Maybe perhaps we go, go to um, our public comment. We have uh, four people signed to speak. First is Raymond Barry. Is Mr. Barry? Yes. And he will be followed by Jane Williams. Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Raymond Berry. I'm pastor at Gethsemane Worship Center, and I'm also a member of Topeka Jump. As you know, Topeka Jump has been advocating for safe and affordable housing for all low-income families who currently fall through the cracks and need help. I'm here to make comments on a resolution that you're discussing, which last month asked you to set aside $500,000 for affordable housing. I understand that proposal is now off the table. However, I have many in my congregation and there are thousands more in the community at large who would have benefited from an allocation for affordable housing. When people have a comfortable home, they complain about streets. What about the ones who lack their most basic needs being met? There's one story I'd like to take just a moment to share. I'm also a hospice chaplain. And as a hospice chaplain, I see many families living in despair. I remember one of the patients that I visited, him and his wife were renting a house in the East Topeka area. They were living there with their three adult children and eight grandchildren. There were three generations living under one household. The heads of the household were living on their social security. Their daughters all had jobs. Satiety tells us that their two adult children should have their own homes. However, none of them could find decent homes that they could afford on their own income. So they pulled their resources together to pay high rent for a three bedroom home that from what I saw was in a state of disrepair. I understand that the private market builds homes for families to live in. If you make more than $40,000 a year, then the private market serves you well. But there is overwhelming research to suggest that private developers cannot make a profit on housing priced for low to moderate income families. The nonprofit housing organization in Topeka has served this niche the best they can, but it's still not enough. In order to attract private money from foundations and banks, proposed projects need to have local public dollars already committed as seed money. While the city of Topeka is not a developer, the governing body should want to invest in housing for the sake of economic development and an increased quality of life for all those who live in the Topeka community. I'd just like to say tonight that I am disappointed that there were not enough city council members willing to be flexible enough to make an impact in this area right now, today. But we expect your attention when a proposal comes forward that can help our community get out in front of this massive problem and begin to turn the tide. I was listening to Ms. Ortiz's comments earlier, and I would just like to say that housing affects all of the individuals that she was referring to. And as I take my seat, I would just like to say, as you return to your comfortable homes tonight, I hope you think of the family that I spoke of earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. 
Jane Williams to be followed by Judy Nicholson. Good evening. My name is Jane Williams and I am a member of JUMP, but you need to know that I am a Topeka resident first. That's what JUMP is. It's a group of residents who weigh in on tough issues and be heard as a constituent. And it is really meaningful to me that I have this opportunity to speak to you as a constituent and feel that my comments matter. Last month, the council was asked to consider a one-time investment in an emerging crisis in our city, affordable housing. That investment was proposed to come from the leftover half-cent sales tax revenue. I understand that for various reasons, making allocations is no longer considered. I value your commitment to the streets because I get frustrated as many of you do as I go through and round town and hit a pothole or a rough street. It is very frustrating. But I'm also glad to see those cones out there and are working. So I value that commitment. But at the same time, JUMP has done well to increase awareness in the community about the rising need to prioritize housing. We are disappointed that the governing body did not take advantage of the opportunity to make a small but meaningful investment in this city's affordable housing crisis. We were prepared to organize hundreds and potentially thousands of your constituents to support your decision to allocate $500,000 to affordable housing. We all know that there will always be a loud voice with a particular concern. But JUMP is meant to listen to the voices that are usually too weak for you to hear. We hold a megaphone to those weak voices so that they get represented too. JUMP is meant to identify the missing voices that may be swamped by second and third shift jobs or by overwhelmed social issues. We say, here I am. I will stand for my brother and my sister and be in their place and speak for them because they cannot speak for themselves. I believe that you know how big the need is for low-income housing. I believe you trust our local nonprofits to come up with a good plan to address this issue. So I just simply want to make sure you know that when a proposal for affordable housing comes before you again, you are supported in your decision to make it happen, not just by five or 20 JUMP members, but also by many families connected to JUMP in various ways. Your attention to this issue cannot wait much longer. Our city needs a plan, a plan that includes recommended funding sources. The individual constitu constituents who make up JUMP care about affordable housing, and we have no plans to move away from this issue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Judy. Thank you for your comments. Judy Nicholson to be followed by Joe Ledbetter is um, <clears throat> Judy Nicholson here, not, not seeing her. Uh, Mr. Ledbetter, then go for you. <clears throat> Governing body, can I have her time too? No. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> well, I support what these people uh, are here about because I too support this $500,000 uh, to be used for affordable housing. Now some of the discussion tonight was, well, we're gonna have to raise taxes. This is not about tax hikes. This is about surplus money. This is not a tax hike. This is one time surplus money from a tax that was started in 2004. So let me make that very clear. As far as economic development goes, Yes, housing is part of economic development. Economic development is probably one of the broadest term words or phrases you could ever come up with. It could be bike paths, it could be housing, it could be recreation. I mean, it could be any number of things. Certainly affordable housing in Topeka is needed. <clears throat> uh, of that money that was allocated in 2004, almost 33% of it was allocated for economic development. Uh, the request tonight of $500,000 out of this money is only 5%. So uh, they have not asked for a very large amount. Last time when this was discussed and it was rolled out very poorly, I thought, by staff, uh, I was not allowed to speak because somebody didn't record my phone call. 
So I've been getting emails now to justify that I have signed up for the podium to speak. I said in an email to the council members, I said this 500,000 could do anywhere from 25 to 30 Toto homes if you don't want to do a new program. I mean, that's a very successful, affordable housing program, and no, I'm not paid to say that. But what I'm saying is this money can have a lot of effect in a community where I have seen, literally, I've been there as a lawyer, I've looked at some of these people's houses uh, with, uh, when I was on the opposite side of landlords or slumlords in cases, I've seen mold on walls, I've seen leaking roofs that leak not in just one room, but all of the rooms in High Crest. And the same slumlord's still in business. He's doing just quite well. He lives outside the county, he won't live in one of his houses, nor would he even live in our city. That's how little he cares about this city, nor would he live in our county. That's how little he cares about this county. And there are others. They live out of South Bay. They live in some very fine houses because I went out from the street. I wanted to view what they lived in as compared to what they were doing to my clients. Kind of gives you a little more passion, you know, when you get into negotiation. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about uh, tax needs, there's one word I'm going to continue to bring up. It's called productivity. Get some productivity out of these tax dollars. And uh, I know that's a separate topic, but it's still going to ring true. That's how you keep from raising taxes. That's how you increase services. Get productivity out of your staff and out of your contractors that are repairing these roads. Quit letting the roads fall apart a year later after they've been repaired. <clears throat> so tonight, I support very strongly uh, the 5% approximate of this money going to affordable housing. And when I look at uh, the staff's explanations, I'm reading them here, uh, then the plan will be uh, presented in a few months to the governing body for a plan and funding consideration. Where's this money gonna come from? Here is your pot of money right now. These are your surplus funds. So where is this money gonna come from in a few months that you're talking about? I haven't heard that nor have I heard what proposal they're gonna roll out in a few months. But you've got a proposal tonight to vote on. I would encourage you to uh, support affordable housing in this amount. I think it's a very small percentage. And yes, streets need fixed, but let's get some productivity as well out of the contractors and staff and make sure these streets are properly repaired in the first place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. That completes the public comment on our resolution 6A, other discussion? Councilman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to support the staff proposal this evening, um, not without lots of thought and conversation with the jump folks. Um, I think all of us on the council know that the council made a commitment to a minimum, to, to working as fast and as hard as we could and as efficiently to move forward to um, to a, a minimum standard of road activity, both re reconstruction and maintenance, and we've got quite a haul to get there. And I, um, we, we committed 100% of this money in a work session in the summer, then the, the 500,000 came up, we're back to that, we have that committed in our capital plan, and we've also tasked the staff with seeing if they can come up with two million dollars out of the operating budget to add to that amount and that's still not enough to get to that minimum level of street maintenance that we we identified in our planning i appreciate the discipline of the council as well as the staff to work on that um, in addition we've made a, a council priority to work on um, improving our code compliance which alone, more efficiently and with not necessarily any additional tax dollars, should improve literally thousands of units that are currently substandard and or not affordable. And so we are working on that as well. Um, we also had our department head from Neighborhood Resources in talking about the funds that are currently in the neighborhood relations budget and targeted toward affordable housing had offered that those could be reviewed in terms of looking at how they are best applied as well. I imagine that that's part of what the staff is considering, but I appreciated that. You know, times like this, 
get us to looking at everything, and that's, that's pretty healthy, and, and I support that as well. Um, I appreciate that the staff has offered to work on a plan. I hope that overall that starts to quantify what, our, what those 7,000 units are, what, what they need, so that we can start to see a better picture of what strategies could be used to address that housing, because that will also prompt us in terms of other funding sources that perhaps we've not thought about yet. Um, I also do know, I, I want to challenge the JUMP folks. I've continued to, to meet with them affirmatively when I could, um, and we got to a point shortly before this 500,000 proposal that people are referencing today and talking about where another 500,000 could come from from the private sector. And I've, I'll stop short of identifying that, but we'd come up with three sources and I'd said, look, I know that you wouldn't necessarily be the ones to operate it year after year, but JUMP has been very good at doing research and testing those ideas. And so I'm hopeful that the leadership will follow through in testing with those three particular resources. There was a 200,000, a 200,000, and a 100,000 to see if people here in Topeka in those sectors felt like they could make contributions at that level as well. So while our staff is working on the staff proposal, and I'm sure that includes the Mayor's Commission on Affordable Housing, and I, I re really appreciate the work that they've done as well, I hope that JUMP will help us by exploring not only those other sources that you may have come up with, but those 500,000 in private sources. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Jensen, thank you. Just a quick comment on the taxes point that a, a couple of other folks have brought up. We have a $380 million hole to fill in terms of roads. So we're gonna have to fill that hole with tax money. And if we keep taking other money out of that hole, we just have to use more tax money to fill it. So while this may be a one-time deal where we have free money falling from the heavens, uh, if we don't fill a hole we have with it, we're gonna have to get money from another source, tax revenue, to fill that hole. So while we may not necessarily be raising taxes to fill it this time, at some point, we're gonna to have to raise taxes and we either use this $500,000 to fill that hole, help fill the hole, of course it won't fill at all, or a $500,000 check from somebody else to fill that hole and uh, often that's gonna be our residents. So yes, it's gonna cause taxes to go up at some point. It may not be noticeable, but money comes from somewhere. It doesn't just come out of thin air, unfortunately. That's just the reality of life. Okay. Other discussion, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one of the one of the most frustrating things about this job that I've just been in a year now has been um, there, there's fantastic things about it, but uh, the terrible thing is there's these problems and you just feel helpless mm -hmm. because they're so huge. Um, last night we had I was at a neighborhood meeting. We had a person from the Y come. And they, this person helps trap kids and people that are trafficked. And, you know, I asked her, what's the need? And she said, we have 12 beds right now. We could use 30 or 60. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what do you do with these trafficked people if you don't have the beds? And she said, nothing. We can't do anything. They can go to the shelter for four days. Um, so I, I, I hate that because I wish we could fix every problem. Um, but I'm also, along with Ms. Clear and Della, Stella Isla, am on the Economic and Community Development. And um, just yesterday we met, and organizations that we funded for a number of years now, um, I want to say there was about 30 organizations that asked for money, people that do great things, the, the YWCA, the Boys and Girls Club, Let's Help, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different great nonprofits, and all of them took a cut, uh, probably about, they don't, no, not everyone knows you, so I can't reveal it, but uh, about 10% aren't getting funded at all this year as we try to um, plug these other holes in our budget. So um, with that, I, I do appreciate the problem, and I wish, I wish we had a lot of excess money um, that, that, that we could solve these problems with, but I am in support of the staff's recommendation. Thank you. And I'm going to just clarify one thing. The, the committee recommends I'm sorry. this to the council. It isn't definite yet that these yes. cuts have been made, but uh, okay, yes. don't want to get you in a hole there that you don't want to. <laughs> sure. All right. Um, other discussion? We have a motion. 
Uh, it's been moved and seconded to approve the, uh, the resolution on the county, countywide sales tax funds. Seeing no other, all those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. We have nine yes. Council Member De La Isla voting no. Nine having voted yes, the resolution is approved. Wait, wait, wait. What? I'm number six. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. What? I'm sorry. Council names. Member Jensen voted no. No, I voted yes. Oh. It looks like they're all yes. No. I've no. got no. There's a red one. I've got De La Isla okay. on, 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 on here. On my map over here says De La Isla. Okay, well, the public map is wrong. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't have names in it. Well, I'm, I'm number six. But can we revoke Mr. Mayor? Right? Well, it's just, okay, what, what, what is the board? Okay, it says board. nine yes, one no, yes. and one no is De La Isla. Councilman De La Isla. Is it De La Isla that voted no? Yes. That's what it says here. It says here, but. So it's right on the record, but it's wrong on the screen. Yes. So are those not, those aren't the position numbers. You have the mayor there. Oh, he's number yeah. one. Yeah. Those aren't your district okay. numbers. All right. Oh. <laughs> All right, see, so those, those aren't are just those aren't just the numbers. Revisiting this, the resolution is passed on a vote of nine to one. Um, that completes the action items for this evening. Okay. We go to the non action items. The first is a discussion of the, the Pika Zoo strategic plan. Mr. City Manager, if uh, I guess the, we'll have the clerk read. We'll take a short break here while we have some people exiting the room. Yeah, I know. That's oh, I never noticed. I have one time they came in. I don't even notice if they did or not. I know. We're going to go and check out if there were any names on there. We really are. There always names on there? Yeah, I usually don't. Okay, yeah. No, I don't know. I just hit the display results. So, okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what it's doing wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, Doug. The pressure's on. I, I, I see that. <laughs> I'll have to ask Brenda. <laughs> it's because hey, there's one more of those. Oh. Yeah, the mayor goes first. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I don't know why on the board, at least. Yeah. I have no That's idea. So there's no way. Okay, we'll be back in session. If the uh, clerk would read um, the. Um, see, even on here, it doesn't matter. Jen. Let's see, let's see. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. If you want to read the discussion item. A is discussion for the purpose of providing an update on the zoo's strategic plan and presentation of a new strategic plan covering the years 2017 through 2020. Mr. Interim City Manager. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, as the clerk read, this is uh, to provide an update on the zoo's uh, strategic plan, some project updates. As you know, it's kind of always a treat when Brendan presents to you. I think we may even have the chance tonight to learn the difference between a possum and an opossum. Uh, so without further ado, I will have Mr. Wiley come up and so which is approaching, one? which one is approaching this podium? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, members of the council, city manager, thank you for allowing me to speak with you tonight. Uh, five years ago, some of you had the chance to see a document that looked like this. It was a strategic plan labeled 2012 to 2017. Uh, it just so happens that the five-year cycle uh, coincides with our accreditation cycle. And about a year and a half ago, uh, this plan kind of fizzled out. And um, before get to the new plan, do want to share with you some of the great things that we were able to follow uh, that this plan helped helped lead the way on. And in effort to keep things brief, we're going to do that with a short video 
uh, because we can cover much more ground faster than I would cover speaking. So I click play. And I don't, would we have audio in here, do you know? Oh shoot, I meant to make another explanation before this played. Um, your staff does not stand around reading the newspaper all day. <laughs> this was actually put together for a presentation for the Capital Journal Editorial Board, and we wanted them to think that our staff stood around <laughs> reading the newspaper <laughs> all day. Um, well, I'll tell you a couple things here. Um, you're gonna see a lot of images that really summarizes kind of who we are and what we've become. And one thing that we wanna capture is we have a uh, metropolitan service area of about 234,000 people, according to the IRS. We see about 203,000 people each year. So that's about a market saturation rate of about 83%. Hmm. Um, a lot of people think that zoos are places for kids. 49% of that 200,000 people are adults, either parents or grandparents. Uh, so understanding that has really helped us focus some of our programming. We don't just program for kids anymore, we program for um, adults, for seniors, uh, for business groups. But we realize that one of our key focuses is really to inspire the people that we interact with because the more we can inspire, the more we can engage, the more we can convince them that it's in their best interest to change in action. It's all good, I'm actually staying on track. I'm not going long. You're not going long, that's good. No, not yet anyway. So, um, influences their education and work plans. So you want to start with me? Okay, go ahead. Probably be best if you did. Uh, you Today, may our animal care programs focus on. You may remember the narrator. Uh, she was here a few weeks ago, uh, recently recognized by National Geographic.
formal education. Our education programs are heard on zoos, at schools, and other venues like libraries and retirement centers. In 2016, over 20,000 people participated in our formal education programs. The other component is conservation. Our conservation efforts are local, regional, and international. We lead the charge of the Kansas accredited zoos in monarch butterfly conservation. It was through monarch butterfly conservation that we introduced our community to citizen science. Nationally, we are part of the Blackfooted Ferret Reintroduction Program. When we started working with this program in 2007, the Blackfooted Ferret was the most endangered mammal species in North America. Thanks in part to our efforts, it is making a recovery. And we support conservation around the world. Whether it's elephants, African painted dogs, or tigers in Southeast Asia, our community is making positive impacts on wildlife a half a world away. Patrons of Blind Tiger, who drink Tiger Bite IPA, are helping to fund the salary for this ranger who is on the ground in Sumatra working daily to prevent the illegal killing of Sumatran tigers. While at the same time here at home, we breed Sumatran tigers. For the endangered species we work with at our zoo, our goal is to collaborate with partners to be able to manage enough genetic diversity to manage a population under human care for 100 years. Then, during that 100 year time frame, we try to fix problems in the range territories of these endangered species. Once the problems are fixed, we focus on reintroductions back to the wild. We are greatly woven into the fabric of the quality of life in our community. Since the Lions Pride exhibit was built in 1989, the last exhibit of the world famous Pika Zoo era, over five and a half million people have come to our zoo. Today, we have over 5,300 household memberships that represent more than 20,000 individual members. Zoo attendance accounts for 30% of the attendance to arts and culture events. We are heading into an exciting era with our zoo and our community. We are literally weeks away from beginning construction on the very first phase of a master plan that was developed and approved in 2012. point out that that was a zoo made video and when we showed it to the CJ editorial board they said hey one of your words was misspelled yes, yes. <laughs> so I looked and I looked for it and I just saw it so wellness. apologize wellness. But the wellness yes. wellness I would blame the person that made that slide but yes. he's yeah so uh, like the city manager suggested I did bring a friend and as we kind of leave this strategic plan area, moving to a new one. But you know what? We need to really think outside the box. And why not get an animal to help do that? So, turn to my friend Penny. This is Penny the possum. Actually, Penny the opossum. Uh, the quick story there is uh, possums are native to Australia. Opossums are native to North America, both marsupials. But uh, in working with Penny and trying to get her to really help me to think outside the box, oh, you're kidding, she's not gonna do it. Well, normally she goes right back in the box. So um, she likes this. The, she's enjoying your company. I should have gone with the court security officer's comment downstairs that brought an awesome oh, possum <laughs> to talk about the possibilities of a oh. new strategic plan. So uh, anyway, real quick about 
a new strategic plan. Uh, one of the challenges that we really got into with the last one is that it was specifically aligned by departments. One of the things that we know about ourselves today is there is a lot of collaboration. A conservation program is gonna have an education piece, it's gonna have an animal care piece, it's gonna have an animal health piece, it's gonna have a research piece to it. So this new plan is very much aligned to incorporate the different parties at the zoo that will work on the action plans. And we aligned it under four main categories. Uh, the first one is organizational excellence that speaks to continuing to grow, becoming a better zoo asset, I'm sorry, a better community asset. Uh, the second, animal wellness. Uh, it is truly a focus, and that's where you'll see a lot of the work from both our veterinary department as well as our uh, animal care staff, our zookeepers. Uh, the third is engage and inspire. Uh, that truly is our focus because we know the better we can become at that, the better we can draw people to the needs of animals, not just here in Kansas, but around the world. And finally, the fourth section uh, speaks to a strategic future. And we're already seeing some of that process play out. Uh, the Camp Calabunga project that uh, even though that was made two months ago, we are still now just weeks away from groundbreaking on it. Uh, it should break ground around June 5th, between June 15th and July 1st. And even with that coming in over bid, we were able to uh, kind of rearrange some of the budget within it, uh, find some extra support. And although it's a few months late, um, work on it will begin soon. Just this past Friday, um, we held a pre-proposal conference at the zoo uh, with the purpose of bringing a general contractor into the Kay's, Kay's Garden project. And uh, that's going to run a little different course. Um, and it should be able to complete design and go straight into construction. And what we're about to see over the next couple of years is dramatic change occur at the zoo that will really set up the framework and foundation for a successful future. We hope that the few pages in here help you understand a little bit of some of the direction we take. And not a picture of Penny, but the Virginia opossum. And if you're in Australia, look for one of these, a possum. So, and take me with you. But, uh, with that, I will stand for questions. Do you, uh, could you describe a bit how you put your strategic plan together? Yes. The, pro the process that was involved? Um, way back in 2011, uh, we worked with a consultant uh, from Disney, of all places. Uh, she was a human resources attorney that worked for Disney and had also worked for Disney's Animal Kingdom. And she helped us <coughs> develop what we refer to as a very simple mission statement, a very profound vision statement, and helped us at that time kind of re-identify what it must have been like to be part of the world famous Topeka Zoo. And so that's the essence that we really tried to capture through our value statements and strategy sta statements, which have changed very little. Um, as the older plan was expiring, uh, we started talking about, you know, do we want to, do we want to approach this internally? Do we want to bring a consultant back? And we, we chose the internal path, but we did it, uh, we did our information seeking through a number of different venues or a um, <coughs> number of different ways. Uh, we had meetings with our entire staff. We had meetings with groups of staff. We did anonymous staff surveys. Um, and we did brainstorming sessions with oversized post-it notes, and eventually we started to see kind of the pieces come together. 
Were the Friends of the Zoo, were they involved? Yes, Friends of the Zoo was also uh, mm -hmm. involved through that process, um, which I would almost need to tell you when they're not involved. At this point, um, we work so closely together in just about, um, in most aspects that it's definitely a, a joint effort. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilman Harmon. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Brenda, the last time you brought an animal to exhibit, you brought a tarantula. Oh, yeah. They proceeded to sit right up here. So. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah, I haven't forgotten either. <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate uh, the, uh, your choice of animals is a little more, a little less uh, disconcerting than before. Uh, in all seriousness, I did want to well, thank you for your, for your presentation and for the strategic plan, but uh, just want to give you some compliments for the direction that you've led our zoo since you're, you've been here. When Sylvia and I first selected in 2005, <clears throat> uh, our zoo was uh, in trouble. Uh, we were regularly criticized by the accreditation agencies. Uh, it seemed like every week you'd open the paper and there'd be another article critical of our zoo. Uh, morale was poor. Uh, and, uh, and then you came on board. And since you've been here, Brendan, uh, the direction you've taken the zoo, and I know it hasn't just been you, you've had great staff and great partnership with Friends of the Zoo, and, the work of Councilwoman Schwartz with uh, uh, the Chief Justice of the state, but it's really, you've really turned, turned the ship around in a remarkable and dramatic fashion to where the zoo is now an asset uh, of the city that we can all take pride in. And that leadership starts at the top and it starts with you. So I just wanna thank you for what you've done and what you've inspired your staff to do and strengthening the relationship between the zoo and the friends of the zoo and the business community here in Topeka. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. I would be remiss to not point out, um, it was a community effort and a collaboration and you're dead on about the staff that's at the zoo. But uh, for a lot of the people that stayed um, and didn't necessarily wanna hear me speak, uh, every city department, I can't think of a city department that has not played a role in turning that zoo around. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Schwartz. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't know how this guy does it. Um, we were at the bid letting meeting last Friday and I, he put on a construction, I mean, he didn't literally put on a construction hat, but you would have thought that he had been talking to construction people all the time. He did a really great job with that. If, if we can convince somebody who was not supportive of caged animals to leave her estate to the zoo, mm -hmm. it's because of the zoo staff. And I think that, that we can't give you enough accolades, Brendan, for everything that you've done. And I love impact in your um, strategic plan and the, what the words stand for. I, you just you continually, your whole staff, and you continually to amaze us as a governing body. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I did want to say, um, Jeff asked me if we would have the construction going for both the Camp Cowabunga and Kay's Garden at the same time. And I thought maybe you could answer that question so that even the public would know what's going on out there. Well, absolutely. And to make it even just more complete, there will also be construction on 10th Street wrapping up through the first part <laughs> and 6th Street uh, through most of it. Um, you know, it's, it's a question I get all the time, especially from the Friends of the Zoo Board. And what we, what we budgeted for essentially was a 7% decrease in attendance this year and a 15% bump in attendance for next year. But a lot of um, other zoo professionals I talked to say bulldozers are good for business. Um, construction means translates to progress. And 
we are going to do whatever we can to make it easy for people to get there through this process. So, will there be construction on both going on at the same time? Yes, there will be. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Yes. Ms. Horst, the answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, and a question um, every once people ask about elephants because we had an issue there for one time and then we had we added two. Do you want to give us a little update on the status of uh, the, our elephant population in Topeka? Absolutely. We have four happy elephants living in Topeka uh, today. Um, Actually, uh, two weeks ago, ish, about, um, the USDA elephant specialist brought a group through to look at our program um, because it has <coughs> dramatically turned around. And um, the two old ones, if you will, uh, the, the two that have lived here for some time, they are still in top-notch health. Uh, the two that arrived, the Asian has really fit into our program quite nicely. Uh, the African is still going through an ad adjustment period, and it's literally to just that lifestyle of, I don't have to do what you tell me to do anymore. I can make choices, and um, it, it's amazing watching an animal kind of come out of that. Um, but they're doing extremely well. Um, you know, this Camp Calabunga project, if, 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 if we tie that back to the uh, half cent countywide retailer sales tax, uh, kind of the zoo conversation in that tax was about an elephant project. The, Camp Calabunga project is really the first phase of that elephant project. And um, we're already very quietly working on the next piece of that phase. Uh, we've got a couple projects to get up and going and done with, but um, we're, we're working on that next one already. Councilman, Councilman Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. I, too, like Richard, would like to say thank you, Brendan, for putting Zoo Topeka together. Um, the, the partnership, the, the game plans, you've always thought way outside of the box, and, and I appreciate putting that team together. Um, I know a, a young man out there, his name is Bobby, and Bobby has wanted to be at the zoo since he was a little boy, and he's a young man now. And he's gone through the training and he volunteered. And Bobby is just like him. He's got a smile <laughs> on his face every day. Um, one of the things I was looking at in the strategic plan, I didn't see, um, and I don't quite know where it would fit in at, because I, I, I know Kay's Gardens kind of overrailed my little my little movie night. So, so can you tell me where that would fit in, what year, we, and, and, and when are we going to have this movie night at the zoo? We're going to do it this summer. Okay. Yeah. And I'm Let the record you. reflect that, please. <laughs> and we are just going to pick a date and make it happen. Okay. Because I know you and Elaine have become close, and you know we, we were there. He's kind of kicked me to the curb, Elaine. But I, I would still like to see that. I think that's continually continuous uh, keeps us thinking outside the box, and I, I think families would love that um, to have the little little Absolutely. animals come out and, and stuff like that. So the record does reflect this summer. Did yes. you hear that, Mr. Okay. Mayor? Just, no, get your, get your down. launch in. Councilman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am so impressed with the shift here. Uh, two two comments that I wanted to address. One, you know, when when even in the eight years only that I've been on council, we've gone from being a zoo that kept animals in cages or other enclosures to being a conservation and education project. And you you displayed that well in the video. Um, but that's a tremendous step forward and a step that much makes gives us a good test for why we have certain animals, how we care for them, why they're there, and you've certainly engaged all of us and certainly the kids and visitors in that global look at where those animals fit. And I, 
I think that that's been smooth, but it was hard won and is now so successful and so integrated. And I want to particularly compliment you on that. The other thing is that for those who did not live through the elephant controversies, oh my God. <laughs> but the, one of the things of that, and I think of us as a community, we are a community who celebrates our heritage from civil right, from the Civil War to civil rights, talking about different races and cultures, integrating, living together, and thriving. One of the big issues with our elephants is that one was African and one was Asian. And we got tons of letters and professional opinions that because they were from different continents, they could not get along. And when people recommended that they go to um, a preserve, um, they would not have been admitted uh, together. And we didn't want to do that. That was one of the things that drove the work with the elephants, because elephants bond, and, and most of the professionals that we talked to said that our two were bonded. So to add another Asian and African pair and have the four mixed living at our zoo and thriving is really groundbreaking for us in, in a way that I think is so appropriate to Topeka. And I want to congratulate you for your confidence mm. and the work that you and the staff are doing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Jensen, thank you. I would just say very quickly, we keep talking about being world famous in the past tense. If the United States Department of Agriculture is coming to our zoo to see how our <laughs> elephant program is working because it's that good, I think we're back to being world famous and we should celebrate that, absolutely. Very good, good point, good point. Other with discussion item? With, 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 with the movie, with the movie yeah. <laughs> Definitely with the movie. And, uh, popcorn. Okay, no other questions? Completes the uh, presentation, unless there are other animals or we're... Thank you, is, thank uh, you very much. that possum from my Possum's backyard? Possum's going to stay. <laughs> okay, that completes that discussion item. We go to item uh, 7B, if the clerk would read. B is discussion for the purpose of providing an overview of the May 23rd, 2017 special meeting of the governing body. And um, governing body, we, we put that on here just for us uh, as the council uh, sort of review what the plan will be for next week. And actually by us stating it here, this uh, takes a place, uh, this is really calling the special session that will be uh, for purpose of discussing the city manager recruitment process. Uh, with Doug Thomas, a recruitment consultant of the uh, SGR company. Uh, be at six o'clock here, the, uh, we'll call the meeting to order, city clerk will take the roll, city attorney will read the motion that would go adjourn into executive session, listing the human resources director, Jackie Russell, and the consultant, Doug Thomas, as the attendees in addition to the governing body. Following that vote then, the interim city manager, the city clerk, uh, and the city attorney would leave, and we would go into executive session for the purpose of the discussing the personnel matters related to non-elected personnel. And at that time, we presented the names of the applicants for the city manager position, and our purpose would be to um, decrease the number down to perhaps uh, what finalists there would be, and then after the next process, those would become public. Um, but not after the meeting next week because we have to go through a process uh, of talking to each of them first. So that is the plan for next week. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on, then we can, so we're, we're all on top of this together. Councilman Ortiz. Someone asked if it was open to the public, so if we're going into executive session, then no, it would not no. be, is that correct? Right. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, and the names are not public at this point until we go down to the finalists, and then those finalists become, would become public eventually after conferring with them. Well, I think somebody wanted to come, and, yeah. and, and I didn't know how yeah. we were going to handle that, so right. basically it's not open to the it's public. Not, it's, yeah, no, it's an executive session, and actually there would be no other business transacted right. during the evening, right. so there would really be even the, the media um, wouldn't have to attend unless they could want to hear us come out of the executive session, uh, but that there would be no, no business um, in the evening. We have one person to speak on public comment, um, Joseph Ledbetter. Good evening, governing body. So I thought opossums were native to Ireland. <laughs> okay. Uh, you tried to be a Brendan. 
Anyway, that was good. This, uh, thank you. <laughs> this decision about deciding uh, who the next manager is going to be is is an incredibly important decision for this council to make. And I remind you that a few months ago, I, I talked about some things I would look for in a city manager. I don't know if you recall that, but uh, I thought I'd review them, at least a few of them. Uh, you have got to get somebody that is an extreme, extremely good problem solver. And to be an extremely good problem solver, they've got to be able to listen. They've got to be able to talk to people that maybe they're not used to talking to. Uh, people that uh, may be creative, may be uh, more, more educated than they are in certain areas. Doesn't mean they're a bad person, it just means you have enough wisdom to listen. Uh, a person that has resolve to uh, tackle and complete extreme problems or extreme tasks. <clears throat> and I talked earlier about productivity. You've got to get somebody, whoever it is, that understands productivity. We have got to look, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it, we gotta look at union contracts, we gotta look at work rules, we have gotta make sure that our services are optimum for the tax money we're paying, and I'm not criticizing anybody, but this is part of your role. And we cannot go into another decade of pretending we've got problems in this community that we don't have to solve, like code enforcement. It's an extreme problem for many people. And I do agree if you would solve code enforcement, you're on the way to solving at least a good chunk of our housing <clears throat> problems, but it's not there. Uh, we've gotta have somebody that's an expert on cost control. They have got to be able to look at contracts with contractors and say, why are these design costs so out of, out of, uh, out of sync with what other cities or other entities are bidding on, on uh, design cost? Should they be at 10%? Mm. Certainly shouldn't be at 24%. Uh, what is going on here? Why is this out of, uh, out of sync? And they need to be able to spot that and deal with it without the council having to tell them to do it. That's their job. Uh, they need to understand the NIA people are some of the greatest volunteers we've got in this community. And when I say that, I'm talking about uh, our past city manager actually went and visited the home of Betty Phillips, sat there for an hour, hour and a half, talking about problems in the NIA. It was after we had that outbreak of crime. It was not immediately after that <clears throat> in Highcrest. But I was so impressed that he would do that. And, and he came away with some better ideas about what to do over in Highcrest. Um, we had, uh, you know, a horrible problem in the summer of 15, and it was dealt with very quickly and very forcibly, and those gang members have not come back. Of course, some of them are in federal prison where they belong, and that's fine with me. And uh, so we're not having that problem in Highcrest anymore. <clears throat> but we still have a horrible problem with uh, the, uh, the code enforcement and, and the slumlords. And I do know that the two issues I hear the most about as a citizen of people complaining are streets and code enforcement. That's what I hear. Now, I know it's probably starting to creep up a little bit about uh, some of the violent crime, but what I've been hearing about for months and months is streets and code enforcement. And uh, so look for that, ask a lot of tough questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comments. That completes the um, discussion item and the non-action items. We go then to, um, uh, I guess there, you, City <coughs> Clerk, you do have a preliminary agenda for next week. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an exec executive Executive session for the purpose of the special meeting is to discuss in executive session the qualifications and characteristics of individuals included in the first round of applicants for the city manager. There will be no action taken at the meeting and the names of the applicants will not be disclosed. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. City Manager, Interim City Manager for your announcements. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, just as always, a couple of brief announcements. I'm pleased to announce that our planning department received three grants from the state of Kansas, totaling 39,000 for historic building surveys. 
in the Country Club Edition, Collins Park, and Greater Avondale, Arbondale neighborhoods. So the, kudos to them for applying and great for us for getting those. Um, Thursday evening, just a re-reminder, is our budget forum. That begins at six o'clock. That's at the LEC. As we've talked about, we'll have a sort of a budgeting 101 overview. Uh, I think the mayor's gonna make some introductory comments and then we'll do a Q and A from the public. And we anticipate going till 7.30 or thereabouts that evening. If you have specific questions, you can certainly get with Nikki on that and in terms of what role, if any, you might wanna play in that process. Uh, also speaking of budget, we have a coffee on the corner tomorrow um, at McDonald's, the one on uh, 28th in California. And the topic, surprise, surprise, will be the 2018 budget. So just another way to uh, get some public outreach on the budget priorities for the upcoming year. Tomorrow is also the uh, bike ride with the city manager and department heads. They seem to think it's optional. Want to make sure everybody understands that it's the bike ride with the city manager and the department heads tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a fun time and we'll be riding to the world famous Topeka Zoo and uh, or thereabouts, about a six mile bike ride and then uh, be coming back here. It's in celebration of course of National Bike Month. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then just on a personal note, I noticed right when I walked in that uh, shortly before the meeting started, my uh, wayward freshman from Emporia State track team walked into the uh, oh, meeting as well, yes, so I'll just is. have him wave. Uh, <laughs> he's back from his freshman year of college and wanted to spend the evening at a city council meeting, so. <laughs> you'll be, you'll, you can report later. Be, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Jensen. No comments this evening. Councilman Schwartz. I'll be brief. Um, my gem for this week is French Middle School and their science project. They wrote me a letter last week and said the eighth grade students um, were having this science um, get together so that you would look and see what they came up with. The goal of the project is to allow students a chance to explore ways to benefit Topeka and take pride in their city. During the rally, the students will present their problems and solution ideas. There was table after table of really great ideas, and so I think our future of Topekans is, is in good hands. Um, the other thing is the designer show house is this week, so get out to that. And we have TGT committee meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Mayor Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank my colleague, um, Councilwoman Clear and uh, Councilman uh, Emerson for taking up uh, empty committee slots that we've been trying to fill. Thanks. Very good, thank you. Councilman Harmon. Councilman Hiller, Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will miss the meeting on Thursday. I'm sure it'll go fine. I have two NIA meetings on top of each other already, so I'll be doing my best to clone. Um, I wanted to give a shout out again to Mr. Dell Wilburn because um, it was he was the gentleman who had the idea of naming the Southeast 10th Street Bridge the Nick Childs Bridge. That was a wonderful ribbon cutting. Mayor did a great job. Jason did a great job. There were lots of people out there. It was just, it was very meaningful to us as a city, I think. And so uh, thanks again to Mr. Wilburn, which by the way, he got the idea because he was researching in the Topeka room at the library and discovered that through using one of our other wonderful facilities. And that's why the librarians were there too. They were pretty excited about that. And that's how it's supposed to work. I, I like that. Also want to give a shout out that the Leadership Topeka graduation uh, last week was a lot of fun. Is it the 42nd, 30? What, do you know many, what year? How many have there been? I, I think about 40. 30, it 30. was, but it was fun, a tremendous class. Um, a room full of alumni who come to greet and cheer on the new class, power hitters and fun. So kudos, Councilwoman um, Delisa was part of that, lots of people, and also um, staff from the- Nikki Lee. Nikki Lee was, Robbie yes. Simmons, no. um, Mitch Page from Fire Department. Is that any more? That was, it. That was ours. So that was, it was a lot of fun to be there to support that as well. And last but not least, uh, oh, there's a crane downtown if you haven't been downtown once again, and it's putting the Cyrus Hotel up. So fun to look at that skyline. It's a big one. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not least, best wishes for everyone to, have, to enjoy the Heartland Nationals next week and to have a safe and pleasant Memorial Day holiday. Thank you. Councilman Clear, Councilman Ortiz. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that kids ride free starting today and it ends, goes to August the 15th. And then I wanted to, I was going to court yesterday and I hit three potholes. Um, and it is terrible. And I just want to know when are we going to get that circle drive um, on the agenda or some type of agenda? It's bad out over there. You're oh, saying, that's I, I've asked that, and they said that's their city property. Um, the driveway between between buildings, between the city and the county? 7th Street. 7th Street, oh, okay. is that between what you call it? the city and the county building. Yeah, yeah. 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 When, when are we gonna get that on, a, on our agenda? Um, and I did have Angela report those potholes to get them fixed, because not only did I hit three, I had four people stop me and say, Councilwoman, that's your responsibility. You guys need to get them potholes fixed. And it's right around the bend. So I, I would just like to know, and if you could get back with me so that we can, we can get that fixed, because there's a lot of traffic that goes through there, but at some point in time, we're gonna have to do something and quick. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was kind of remiss earlier. I, uh, Pat Michaelis in the Capitol Journal has a has a great op-ed he wrote. It talks about a um, Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act of 2017, and it basically just says to expand the housing credit by 50% over the next 10 years, creating an additional 400,000 <laughs> affordable homes. Um, so I, I guess I take some, some comfort in uh, perhaps the federal government's finally going to do something to, to help us in that area. Um, on, on a personal note, I, I wanted to congratulate my daughter, Sydney, who is graduating um, this Sunday, I guess it is, from uh, from Shawnee Heights. So uh, it was a fantastic class and I'm gonna miss all those kids. So can, nice job, Sydney. Councilwoman DeLisa. Okay, that completes our announcements for this evening. A public comment, uh, Joseph Ledbetter. Do what? He signed up. You know, we also now have available for people to sign up for meetings. So when you get this list, there are going to be names added. I think you signed up for meetings. He's not a public comment. Am I okay? I mean, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, governing body. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that was mentioned earlier in the uh, sales tax discussion was, uh, and, and I actually agreed with uh, one of the council people who said this, was that uh, once we enforce codes, a lot of the housing problems will start to be solved. And I have said that for a year and a half. I have continued to say it. And I will continue to say it until it's fixed. But it is one of the key ways to get economic development in this community and get housing issues solved. And uh, so anyway, I wanna talk about this uh, 2040 plan that uh, I visited the other night, <clears throat> saw there's a proposal to spend $1.8 billion over the next, I think, 22 years. I'm going off memory here, but uh, the uh, consultant, we paid $220,000 for that. And uh, he started talking about projects that couldn't be funded. And he mentioned uh, the East Topeka Interchange with the uh, Turnpike, which has uh, been un unserved and uh, underutilized for 50 years for that neighborhood. <clears throat> and he said it was a $30 million project. Of course, it's a $17 million project. And I'm going, Seriously? The volunteers know the numbers better than the presenters? And then I asked him after the meeting, I said, uh, now, at what part do we talk about economic development and the value of projects for economic development? Because I don't recall much of a discussion about that. But when I went back and looked at the surveys, I could see that uh, about 710 people in that survey pool had said that economic development was important uh, as to how we spend our dollars for infrastructure to create more jobs, to help stabilize neighborhoods and their infrastructure, and which includes their commercial developments. You don't want these commercial developments going dark. That's your tax base, that's your jobs, and it also adds tremendous value to neighborhoods when they do have grocery stores, when they do have 
uh, other commercial developments that the people in those neighborhoods can use. And, and that's very provable if you want to talk to some appraisers, uh, they'll talk about that. So I was, I was kind of shocked at that, that we didn't have much of a discussion about that, even though people had put input in on it, and I remember specifically myself doing it. So what good are studies if we're not taking seriously the input of the public, in my opinion, from what I could see, and I, I guess there's another meeting coming up. I'll be happy to attend it, but uh, I don't go to these meetings to waste my time. I expect people to listen. We're the ones that live in this city. We're the ones that pay for these studies, and uh, these people from Lawrence or wherever they come from, which in that case he did, how about you listen to us? And how about you help us solve problems? Uh, I also, you know, just, in watching that, it, it reminded me of other studies I've seen in the past that just went in the trash basket because I think the public was not engaged over what these consultants wanted to do. And, uh, and I've seen some good studies where the public was engaged, but uh, I had a lot of question marks after I left that meeting, uh, a lot more than answers. And that's, that's not usually uh, what happens when I attend these meetings. I actually get answers and, uh, and I come away with a feeling that we've actually done something. Um, anyway, that's enough on that. Uh, have a good evening and a good next meeting. See ya. Thank you for your comments. Completes the public comment. Um, City Attorney, could you provide the parameters for the executive session? The motion would be to recess into executive session for a period of 10 minutes to discuss personal matters in order to protect the privacy of the individuals involved. In order to aid the discussion, the following individuals should be present, members of the governing body and interim city manager, Doug Gerber. Okay. Is there a motion to such? Councilman Jensen moves. Uh, Councilman Deputy Mayor Cohen seconds. Go into executive session for 10 minutes. Um, all those in favor, vote yes. Post vote no. Has everyone voted? Okay. You vote. Okay. Hey, all right. Ten, yes. ten having voted yes, we'll go into executive session when room is clear. So we'll take a short or ten minutes. Maybe we don't need a break. It's a, it's a, we don't need a break.